The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Once more, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again, he sent other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his slaves, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. Then he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot, and throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Well, this service, as opposed to the 8.30 service, gave a better response to the end of that gospel. Praise to you, Lord Christ. We'll just say that the 8.30 was a little more sleepy, perhaps. But it is an odd thing. It is an odd thing for the last two sentences of a gospel lesson to be... Bind them, bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth for many are called but few are chosen. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Does it seem like there's very much praiseworthy in those last sentences? And it seems so odd that all of this punishment has occurred over a fashion faux pas. After all, some people do get thrown out of weddings. As a priest, I've thrown people out of weddings. Thrown out a couple of photographers. I've also thrown out those who were filled with spirits other than the Holy Spirit. But I've never said, take them and bind them hand and foot and throw them into the churchyard. Why is this king so enraged? The idea that someone is not properly dressed at his son's wedding banquet. We'll get back to the king and his rage in a moment. But in our world... In our culture, in our society, there are simply times when you must be dressed for the occasion. For instance, there are times at certain sporting events, let's just say in the Southeastern Conference, where my own beloved Ole Miss Rebels play, and we got dressed up as pledges. We were supposed to put on our game day best because we were going to battle. And so every Saturday when I was a pledge, I had to wear, oh Lord, a white shirt, red and blue stripes. I believe khaki socks as well, which looked horrible with the burgundy penny loafers I had to wear. But if I didn't wear that, not only would I be in trouble, 
but the rest of my pledge brothers would be in trouble and we would pay the price that week. Now, the rule might have been arbitrary. As a matter of fact, looking back on it, it was quite stupid that I paid money to have people tell me what to wear to a football game. But in that context, it mattered so much to be dressed properly. And that's where we find ourselves at the end of today's gospel. But let's go back to the start. We have been dealing in St. Matthew with Jesus for the past two weeks, giving us parables about who is furthering the kingdom of God, who is entering the kingdom of God, and who is not. And if you think you're uncomfortable out there, imagine how uncomfortable Matthew's understanding of God's kingdom. The king has a son who has a wedding, and all the important people are invited. It's the, literally the royal wedding. And nobody comes. It says one went off to his farm for a long weekend. One was finishing up his business. And still others, in true Matthean fashion in these parables, decided that they would kill the king's messengers. An allusion to how in history, the prophets of God had always been killed. And so the king decides, fine, you don't want to come? Not only are you not going to come to this, this party, you're not going to another party again. And he goes and he kills all of them and burns down their cities. And then he says to his slaves, now go out into the streets and invite everyone you see. All of a sudden, the king is hit with this sense of generosity and inclusion and invitation and hospitality. And the wedding hall is filled. I love how Matthew says it is filled with both the good and the bad. Everybody is there. And the king comes out and he's greeting his guests and going through... ...not wearing a wedding robe. And the smile on the king's face fades because he asks the man, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? Not only is he thinking about the man in front of him who's not dressed appropriately, he's thinking about which of his guards let the guy in. It's going to be a serious chewing out later. And then we get a funny reply, at least something that, that, that I, I was not expecting the first time I read this parable. We get no reply at all. The man is speechless. He is speechless before the king. Well, the king's famous temper returns. You are chosen. The great sin that the man committed is not that he failed to have on the appropriate attire, at least according to the commentators that I agree with. The man's sin, or his mistake, is that he is speechless. He's apathetic. After all, the difference from love is not hate, the difference of love is apathy. He's simply shown up carefree, worry-free. No response whatsoever to the king's question. As Christians, especially as Christians who have come after the English Reformation and indeed after the Protestant Reformation, it is very easy for us to believe that we are simply all right. As Episcopalians, we're known, in fact, the jokes abound about how we are carefree. Or as my Jesuit friend likes to say, he doesn't even say diet Catholic, he calls us junior varsity. 
And yet, and yet, there is a serious point here. It is not that the wedding robe somehow represents salvation. For salvation is accomplished by Jesus Christ and His cross and resurrection alone. It is about our response. And the response to the gospel of Jesus Christ is not simply walking the aisle and saying the sinner's prayer and being baptized. The response to Jesus Christ is a life of putting on Christ. Of putting on the love. Of putting on the sacrifice. Of putting on the good deeds of our Lord. And taking those into the world. For if we do not do that. We are simply naked. Naked carrying nothing from inside these doors. Out into a broken and hurting world that is desperate to hear about the love of Jesus Christ. It's about getting dressed, my friends, and not with garments that you or I can make, but with the garments that Jesus Christ has so freely given us. That is what we put on when we take the Eucharist, when we hear the words of Scripture, when we go out and serve Jesus Christ in the faces of the poor and those on the margins. That is the wedding feast. We fail to do so. We've forgotten whose we are and how we are to dress. So this week, let us remember the sacrifice of our Lord Christ. The clothing that those beautiful events form for us and wear the wedding garment of the bride of Christ, for that is what you and I are. Let us put on our wedding garments of the love of Christ and go forth into the world and say to those who are hurting, to say to those who are in grief, to say to those who are hungry, dear friend, I have a wedding robe for you as well. And let us bring all good and bad into the feast of Jesus Christ our King.